Harry Simu. Let's get into the Gunners, shall we? Uh, good win on Tuesday night in the end. Looked very comfortable for a very long stretch of the game. Uh, Forrest just about got into it right at the end. Um, but they managed to get the job done. And that's a really important win, isn't it? Yeah, that's what matters. It sets up the game on Sunday really, really well. Um, as we mentioned a little bit earlier on, Arsenal now, if they beat Liverpool on Sunday, can move to within two points of them. And when you think about the run that Arsenal went through not that long ago, that seemed impossible. It felt like they were losing ground, that they were going to fall behind and that the season, I'm not going to say ended or, or was capitulating as such because there's still lots to play for, but it felt like it was only heading in one direction. So it's good to see Arsenal sort of restabilise. The Forest win was really, really comfortable. The score doesn't maybe tell that story, but in mm. terms of dominance, control, Arsenal were well on top. Um, I think in a weird way, sometimes you kind of want to be, be in a situation where you're not, you don't drop points, but you're almost reminded that you can't take anything for granted in this league. And it's a reminder that you need to be clinical because yeah. Arsenal in the first half had 81% of the possession and didn't force a single save out of Matt Turner. Yeah. So I it mean, shows to be you... fair, it was, it was one of Matt Turner's best performances for Arsenal, wasn't it, in the end? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, in the end. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, it was funny when that goal went in, and, and so many people say, oh, what a finish from Jesus, such a tight angle. And it was, to be fair, but come on, he's got to do better than that, hasn't he? He has got to do better, the goalkeeper. There's no doubt about that. If it was my keeper, I'd be screaming <laughs> um, at the fact that he's allowed that to go in. But you also have to give Jesus credit for having the audacity and the confidence to try something like that because mm. this is a guy that everybody keeps talking about as not being this killer in front of goal as not being anywhere near potent enough in those situations it's really interesting because going into the game he had an issue with his knee which has been giving him problems pretty much all season there was some fluid gathered on the knee and I remember watching him come out for the warm-up and thinking why is his knee so heavily strapped but we then found out that he'd done everything to make sure that he was fit and available. And then when you hear that someone's battled through that over the course of the week and then they're the difference maker, it's, mm. it's a nice story. Yeah, another really good performance, like you say, from him. It's the way that he, he's able to draw defenders away. The, the link-up play is, is just absolutely superb. Does it worry you at all? Because I know that you have said for a long time you didn't think that Arsenal were going to do any business in this transfer window. Is there, is there any sign of you that, that does worry that they don't have that, that clinical striker that has been talked about for so long? Yeah, obviously you, you want to have that player within your ranks, but the, the real problem for Arsenal has been this season is that Saka, Martinelli, Odegaard and, and various others haven't contributed in the same way. Can you it's, see them kind of clicking into form now? I, I feel like I, I feel like I can. Saka obviously got another goal. I think that was his seventh in the league mm. the other night. Martinelli got a couple against Crystal Palace as signs that he's coming back into form. Leandro Trossard hadn't been anywhere near as effective um, when he got opportunities this season. Mm. So you hope that it's going to click and Arsenal are going to move into top gear this thing about going into the window and expecting a striker to come in I think it's, it's kind of people winding themselves up really because we all knew that Arsenal weren't going to be able to spend big in the window regardless and then the profit and sustainability thing come up and what that's done is is shown us that this is a league-wide problem. Yeah. It's not just no one club. No one's done business. Newcastle are the richest club in the world, on paper, <laughs> yeah. but they can't spend any money. So yeah. it goes to show We'd have you... had to have let players go. Exactly. Is this is a bizarre. problem for everyone yeah. at the moment. So yeah. if you sat there thinking Arsenal are going to go and bring Ivan Tony in, for example, mm. who hadn't kicked the ball for six months, by the way, competitively... Mm then you're living in another in another planet. It just wasn't yeah. going to happen. It's true. He has looked but, uh, looked good since he's come back, to be fair. Ivan Tony, I think two goals already um, since his return, uh, especially one last night against, uh, against Tottenham as well. Um, talk to me about Emil Smith-Rowe because he came into the side for this game. Firstly, uh, he, he kind of took up that Havertz role, yeah. didn't he? How did you feel that he got on? Because for such a long time... People have been kind of clamouring for him to to get back into that Arsenal side for at least Mikel Arteta to, to give him a bit more game time. Do you think that he got on well? So this is going to be an unpopular opinion. Oh, okay. I know it's, Not for I the know first already. time, Harry. Whenever you um, say anything mildly critical about a Hayland graduate, it doesn't go down well. <laughs> um, look, I think he's a player that is undoubtedly extremely talented. I think he's got it all. Um, he's a brilliant dribbler. He's shown over the years that he can be a really cold finisher when it matters as well. I think the left eight role in this Arsenal team is a very specific role. It's not a role in which Mikel Arteta is expecting you to get too involved in the build-up. A big part of the job is to get up alongside the centre-forward. And that's partly why I think he looks at Kai Havertz and thinks he's really well suited to that. Mm. Because of his height, because of his stature, gives you a bit more of a, a kind of direct target as well. So 
you got to factor that in. I think for Emil Smith-Rowe, it's not his game to be on the peripheries. He wants to be on the ball more. He wants to be more involved in the build-up. And in that role, I don't think he gets the chance to do that much. He ghosted into a few really good positions the other night, but obviously, you know, he didn't score or anything like that. But I thought he did well, given what he was tasked to do. The problem I've got with it is that him in that position gives you nothing defensively. Mm. And I'm not saying Kai Havertz is a brilliant defender, but because of his stature, because of his size, he's, he helps you with set pieces. And also he's got the fitness levels to get back and support the midfield when necessary. Emil Smith-Rowe will have those fitness levels in time, but at this moment, while he's still working back to, to his best condition, he doesn't have that, mm. that ability to get up and down in the same way. And after 65 minutes the other night, he was he was blowing and had to be replaced. So I think it can work in some games, but I don't think you can go into too many games against the league's best teams with Rice holding a loan and expecting Emil Smith-Rowe and Odegaard to both be on mm. the pitch and give you what they need to defensively. Let, let me throw this at you then, because what you've basically said there is you, you've essentially got a square peg in a round hole in, in terms of playing Emil Smith-Rowe in that position. And I do agree with you. And I don't think Kai Havertz has set the world alight, but I do think he's more effective in that position than Emil Smith-Rowe. Now... There's been certain games this season where I don't think Odegaard's been at his best. I think that he, you know, he's lacked a bit of form in, in a number of, of of Arsenal's games this season. Such a quality player, he's he's been fantastic. He was amazing last season. Do you think that it would be fair for for Arteta to say, right, let's give Smith Rowe a go? He's he's that's the position that he wants to surely play in. Is is that role where, as you say, he's got more of the ball? He's trying to dictate plays, making things happen. Is that an option for Arteta? And do you want him to explore that more as a manager? Um, I'd like to have an alternative to Martin Odegaard when it's not going that well. But I don't think there is anyone that gives you the same level of creativity. I think even... So I came away from the game the other night thinking he didn't play that well. And I watched the game back the next day and I'm not saying he was great. But I think mm. I counted four um, big passes in terms of creating clear opportunities for people. And I just don't know that that's Emil Smith-Rowe. I feel like Emil Smith-Rowe is more likely to pick up the ball, go on a dribble into the penalty area and maybe score a goal himself. But I think because of Odegaard's creativity, you kind of need him in there. Mm. Um, with Smith-Rowe, listen, I think there's a lot of games where you can get away with playing the 1-6 and the two advanced midfielders. Mm. And we've seen Arsenal do that for most of the season because they've been without Thomas Partey. On a couple of occasions, he's put Jorginho in the midfield alongside Rice. And I think that's worked really well. That's what I'd do at the weekend, by the way, um, against Liverpool. I'd play Jorginho as the six and I'd have Rice and Odegaard as the two eights. Okay. Because Rice has that ability to get up and impact the game, yeah. but also can drop in alongside Jorginho, who we know isn't the most mobile. Mm. And I think that gives you the best Would you balance. trust Jorginho kind of in that defensive role as well, especially coming up against Liverpool? I, I would if he's got Rice alongside him, because that's what we did in the FA Cup and it worked really well. Mm -hmm. And we've done it in a few big games. I'm pretty sure that's what Arteta did against City. Um, in the league when Arsenal beat them this season as well. So I think that seems to be his go-to at the moment in the absence of Thomas Partey. Emil Smith-Rowe, for me, his best position is when he plays out on the left. If you go back to the great run of games he had before he started having the injury problems where he was pretty much Arsenal's biggest goal threat, it was coming in off that left-hand mm. side. But again, he doesn't give you the width that Martinelli does. And so that then impacts the system in other ways. Mm. So I, I'm, I'm kind of wondering what we do with Emil Smith. I think at this moment in time, it's about getting him up to peak condition, giving him minutes. He's been out for a long time. It was his second start in the Premier League since May 2022. So wow. this is someone that really does need to find regular game time. And then I think we can go from there. But as good as he looked and as excited as people are about his return, I wouldn't be surprised in the slightest if Arsenal this summer were to cash in on him. Homegrown player, mm. pure profit, as they say. And I'm not really sure that there's a, a, a role for him, a specific role it's, for him. It just feels like the wrong time for him, for him potentially, as well at the moment. Uh, let's talk title race with that huge game obviously coming up on, on Sunday. Uh, out, out of 100, if you were going to do it as a percentage at the moment, how do you feel about Arsenal's chances in the, in the title race? Where are you in that, in that um, as a percentage? And the percentage being how much you think they're going to win the league. Not in terms of relative to the other team's percentage, <laughs> right? Because that's too much maths for me to do <laughs> yeah. on the spot. But oh, you've, you've lost me there completely. Think, so, so basically, if I say Arsenal are 20%, then I've got to divide the other 80% up between <laughs> no, City stop, and Liverpool. Stop, stop. I can't do that. Stop. So in terms of Arsenal's chances alone, I'm going to say they're about 30%. 30%, okay, yeah. yeah. What if they beat Liverpool on Sunday? Then it goes up. Um, how much? 
50. 50 percent. Really? I would go, yeah, really? because I think I think Arsenal are in this position without having even played well all season. Mm. And if they manage to come o- overcome this hurdle of Liverpool, close the gap. I think there'll be the belief within the group that they can kick on. And I think last season, Arsenal peaked really early. The first half of the season was incredible. And then after Christmas, there was a few questionable results. And then again, at the back end of the season, there was a bit of a dip. Mm. And I think for me, you know, it's, you can peak too early in football. We've seen it so many times. Imagine, are you, so you can see this Arsenal team peaking late this season? I think this Arsenal team can be a lot better than they've been so far this season. And as long as they're within touching distance then w- there's no reason why those pieces can't click into position. Mm. Thomas Partey's return is going to be massive mm-hmm. because I think with Partey, Rice and Odegaard in midfield, it's as good as any midfield in the league. And Arsenal have been without that all season. Yeah. Jurian Timber was brought in to help in the left-back position where defensively we're vulnerable and he's not been available yeah. all season. So although people have been really critical of Arsenal and said they're not as good as they were last year, I think there are reasons for that. Mm. And I expect that once they get those players back, especially Thomas Partey, because Timber might be back as late as March, April, I think Arsenal can go up to another level. And if they're within touching distance at that point, why can't they? Why can't they accelerate? Yeah, for, uh, for me, at the moment, I'm still backing Manchester City as the as the favourites. I think Liverpool proved last night as well. They they looked so good. City are the favourites, undoubtedly. But, but City have to be up there as the, as the favourites. We know that they're they're capable of just going on those ridiculous runs. But I can just imagine Harry Arsenal fans listening to that, getting a bit of a tingle again about this title if you don't race. Don't have hope, Ollie. What's the point? Of <laughs> what's that? the point in football? Well exactly. exactly. Uh, this is